If you're new, this is how I'm welcomed every week. Uh, today we are doing something for the first time in the seven and one half year history of our church. My wife, Lindsay, is joining me on stage. We are going to start a brand new series today called Called Out. And what we're going to do in this series is expose some lies that we as Christians believe. And some Christians have told us these lies. Culture tells us these lies. We've bought into them, but it's not what Scripture teaches is best for us. So we're going to call out these lies in this series. And I hope you'll be here every week for the next five, uh, six weeks or so. Today, we're going to call out a mentality that a lot of Christians fall into because a lot of culture falls into that says an okay marriage is okay. That's the title today, an okay marriage is okay. In fact, we were, um, Lindsay was telling me about, uh, we were watching like a few different videos online of preachers when they've had like their wives teach on marriage and stuff, see if we could get any pointers. And she told me about one. Tell them. Yeah, I was story. watching a, a sermon this week and a couple was preaching together and the husband said that they just never fought. They just didn't have time to fight. And they, he said, the reason we don't fight is we just don't have time because we're serving God so much. And so I was telling Carl about this when he got home one day from work, and he said, I just can't relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, this guy was like, we're so busy serving God, we just don't have time to fight. I was like, well, uh, can't relate. I'm not going to watch that one. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we can't relate to that guy. But I think, I hope, that makes us more qualified to teach today because we're not up here to say hey, we never fight, so if you never want to fight, we can tell you how. What we can say is, hey, marriage has real struggles because it involves real broken people, so if you want to learn how to navigate that, we figured a couple things out from Scripture that we think help, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to give you three different lessons. We're going to give you three different lessons today. Before we get into those, though, let me say this, too. A lot of the time, Christians in churches communicate that if you're not married, something's wrong with you. That marriage is the pinnacle of existence if you really love Jesus. And so if you're not married, something obviously is, is wrong with you in your life. And that's just not what scripture says. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 7 today. And Paul says in this chapter of the Bible, I wish everyone were single just as I am. He goes on to say, if you're married, your interests are divided because you have to spend time pouring into your spouse. You have to spend emotional energy and money on that. But if you're not married... You can give everything you have to the work of God. If you're single, you have more of yourself, your time, your resources, your energy to give God through his church. That's what Paul says. So if you're married, your interests are divided. And so we're not here today to say this is obviously the best thing you could possibly ever do is get married. That's just not what scripture teaches. And if any Christian ever says that, they're just not saying what the Bible says. The reality is there are a bunch of you here who won't get married. And that's fine. Paul would say that's great because you're gay and God's called you to be celibate or you haven't found somebody you want to marry yet or maybe you're divorced and you say, I just don't want to risk pain like that again, so I'm good. Or maybe you just won't, um, maybe, maybe you've just decided not to get married. But for whatever reason, we don't want today to be something of, well, if you're not married, then you know we'll kind of push you to the side because we think the lessons we're going to talk about really do apply to every single relationship you have. It's just that marriage is a closer-knit bond. It's the only relationship where two to become one. So it's more intimate and more vulnerable in a way than any other relationship. So these lessons are, are more true there than anywhere else. So here's the first lesson I want you to write down. Is God wants you to have a great marriage. Now, I always talk about taking notes. And if you don't take notes, like I get offended sometimes. But if you don't take notes today, my wife's going to get offended. And if somebody offends my wife, we got issues. So <laughs> if you don't want to meet me in the parking lot after church, you need to write this down. <laughs> God wants you to have a great marriage. And I know, again, for a lot of you, that's hard to believe, right? Because you're single, you're divorced, you have a bad marriage, you're thinking, well, I want a great marriage, but God obviously doesn't want me to have a great marriage, or I'd have that. I want, you to, show, I want to show you what Paul says. He says, a wife must not leave her husband, and the husband must not leave his wife. The baseline of Christian marriage is faithfulness. You don't leave. That's it. Now, growing up, I just kind of latched onto this idea from Scripture and thought, that's not just the baseline of marriage, that's the pinnacle of marriage, is you just don't leave. Faithfulness is God's goal for you. But after studying scripture as a whole, I realized faithfulness is the baseline, but God's real goal for you is fulfillment. God doesn't want you to just be faithful, he wants you to be fulfilled in marriage. Let me show you a couple more scriptures. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2 says, because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, 
and each woman should have her own husband. He's writing to the first century city of Corinth. He's saying, listen, this is a sex-crazed culture. There's so much sexual immorality in your midst, it's hard for you to control your sexual urges. So if you need to express yourself sexually, the way God has designed for you to do that is a man and a woman in marriage. That's it. So if you need to express yourself sexually, that's God's way of doing it. He expands. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife... Bro, you don't want to do that. (laughs) The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, look at this last sentence. Here's what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying, when you are married, you have sex with your spouse as much as you possibly can and do not stop having sex with your spouse until both of you say you need a time out to spend some time in prayer. And then as soon as you say amen... Start having sex with your spouse again and do not stop having sex with your spouse again until it's time to pray some more. That's the Bible, folks. That's not Carl. You should read it. It's good. (laughs) The point is God wants you to have a great marriage. And I know some of you are thinking that's crude, that's whatever. But let me show you something else Scripture says about marriage. It says, as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. And if that offends you, hang with it. Hang with it. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church He gave up his life for her. So I want you to imagine a marriage that lives out the scripture. Imagine a marriage where the husband says, hey, hon, uh, I'm going to be Jesus to you. And how Jesus loved the church is what I'm going to do for you. So I'm going to give up my life every single moment of every single day with every fiber of my being in every way I can imagine in any way you want to tell me so I can die to myself to serve you. And then the wife just says, okay, I'll follow your example. That would be a marriage in which sex would then become a healthy expression of the bond that exists every moment of every day, where 1 Corinthians 7 would be true. God wants you to have a great marriage. So why don't you talk a little bit about some ways we try to live this out. Yeah, because God wants you to have a great marriage, your marriage has to be a priority, and your husband has to be your priority. Um, This is hard to do when you're newly married. Sometimes you're used to spend a night out with the guys or with the girls, or sometimes you're just pouring into your career because you're in a new career. And sometimes it's hard when you have little kids because you feel like your kids are so needy and you have to change them and feed them. And you, they are needy and those things are important, but you can't neglect your husband. And so you have to do things together that draw you closer. And so for us, what we like to do is we watch sports. We love to travel together. I would watch a lot more TV if I were single. I would watch a lot more HGTV if I were single. <laughs> And she wants to be best friends with Joanna Gaines. That's like her life's yes, ambition. I yes, I love JoJo, yes. But Carl doesn't really like TV, and so I have chosen not to watch TV, and we spend more time in the evenings together. And sometimes if you're, if you're older and you're retired, you get caught up in pouring into your grandkids, and you forget about your husband, who's, who's the most important relationship. Yeah, and men, I think we need to work really hard on this, too, to make our wives our priority your wife, your priority. Uh, We're really good at fighting for her and trying to win her over when we date, right? We will go to the ends of the earth. We will be crazy. We will do things we are so embarrassed about and would never tell a soul about. Actually, when we dated, one time I was dropping Lindsay off at the end of a date. She was getting out of the car, like to go back into her apartment, you know, and I said, wait a second, I actually have something for you. She said, what? I said, I need you to sit on the driveway here. She thought that was weird. I reached in the trunk. I got out a guitar and I sang her a song. It was so good. It was so good. It, it was not good. I love, <laughs> I love her, so I've never sung to her again. <laughs> but we will do crazy things when we're trying to win her love, right? And what I've learned from husbands who are more experienced and better at this than I am is that that doesn't stop when you get married, that you have to continue to fight for her heart because other people are, other things are. So you continue to fight for her heart and her emotions and her intellect to make her, that win her as the priority in your life. Yeah, one way we do this is we have a weekly date, a quarterly getaway, and a yearly vacation, all without kids. Yeah, so, <laughs> vacation without kids. 
Yeah, so we, we've done that. We've done a weekly date for about six years. I think the quarterly getaway we've done for two or three years. And the quarterly getaway is just usually one night in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the yearly vacation is three or four days out of state. But all those things take money, so your marriage has to show up in your budget. Your marriage mm -hmm. has to take a priority in your budget. Preach. They take uh, money. That's good, y'all. <laughs> Babysitting takes money. Obviously, food, out to eat, that takes money, travel. And you, you have to see it in your budget if you want to make it a priority, if you want to make it a priority. Yeah. And also, God wants you to have a sexually satisfying marriage. Um, women, sometimes we don't understand man's need for sex. Kay Warren says, if men go a whole week without sex, women should pretend that he gets home from work and doesn't say a word to you all week. It's the conversation that, that she says is comparable. And I know if I would, if he would not talk to me for a whole week, I would be very frustrated with him. <laughs> Dr. Willard Harley has this illustration I think is helpful um, when talking about sex and marriage. He says, imagine you have a bottle of water on a stool like this, and the wife is thirsty. But for some reason, she's immobilized, and she can't reach the bottle of water. The only person who can get that for is her husband standing between her and the bottle of water. So she says to him one day, hey, I'm really thirsty. Can you, get me a, a, can you hand me that bottle of water? And the husband says, well, you know, I, I really don't feel like giving you that bottle of water, so maybe in a couple hours. So a couple hours go by that night, they're, you know, in bed, and she's really thirsty, and she can't reach the bottle of water. So she says, hey, it's a couple hours later, can you give me that bottle of water? And the husband says, you know, oh, it was such a long day, and I'm tired, I'm already in bed, and I just don't um, want to hand you that bottle of water right now. So maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll reach that bottle of water for you. So next day, she's gone a whole day without water at this point. She says, will you please give me the bottle of water now? And the husband says, why do you always have to ask for a glass of water? You'll get a glass of water when I'm in the mood to give you a glass of water. And the wife can feel her temperature rising. She starts to get frustrated. She's not happy. She's thirsty. The only person who can give her a drink is her husband. She begins to demand a glass of water. So the husband gets offended, and he says, well, you're not going to get any water with an attitude like that. <laughs> Finally, the next day, the husband says, okay, fine. Here's your water, but drink it quick, and don't ask for any tomorrow. What's going to happen? She's going to drink it, but she'll be bitter. She'll be frustrated. And Bob Russell says this. He says, if you are not sharing love in your marriage, you are sending your spouse out to a food court full of free samples. Sex has to be, marriage has to be a place where you are sexually satisfied. And if you submit to scripture in this, it will be. Yeah, and because God wants you to have a good marriage, we, a great marriage, we firmly believe that you may need to go to counseling at some point. About seven years ago, we decided... And by May, we mean May. You will. You're going to have to go to counseling. counseling. <laughs> About seven years ago, we um, realized that we needed counseling. Our baby at the time decided he did not ever want to sleep, and he decided he wanted to scream instead of sleep. So we were not... We were missing... Like, that's literally all he did. We, he we ate. Were, he pooped. He screamed. Yeah. Like, you live with someone who screams. But he's a good boy 20... now. He's seven, and he's a great boy. He never screams. Nonstop. Anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway, we were missing each other. We were tired. We were frustrated. We were not communicating well. And so we made a counseling appointment, and we went, went for several months. And it was uncomfortable. It was expensive. Mm -hmm. It was not fun. Most weeks, I didn't want to go. But looking back, it was, worth, it was worth the money we spent. It was worth more than what we spent on it. And sometimes we'll have couples come to us, and they'll say, we just can't afford marriage counseling. And I just don't understand that. I don't understand that because how much is your marriage worth I'm just gonna let that hang because some of you need to hear that uh, when God wants you to have a great marriage it's based on two things and you're part of mosaic this isn't gonna be a surprise to you it's grace and truth right I mean those are the two ingredients to a, a great marriage as God wants you to have so we're gonna talk those in, in reverse order here's the scripture uh, on truth it says the important thing is to keep God's commandments we have made in our marriage, in our lives individually, and as a marriage, we've decided to believe that God's commandments are true, that they're what's best for us, that God is our creator who designed us, who loves us, and who gives us the best way to live so we can live freely and lightly. And so what that means is not just that we have scripture to base our lives on, it means we live true and open lives, honest lives with each other. So the way we say is this, be truthful with each other. Be truthful with each other. You live in truth. Yeah, and that means you have to communicate about the good things. Sometimes people get caught in a trap, and they just want to talk about the bad things. They just want to say, oh, this really bothered me when you did this, and this frustrated me when you did this. And those things are good to communicate about, 
but they forget to communicate the good things. And so Carl said from stage before, what gets rewarded gets repeated. And so tell him something good that he's done and, and remind him that you like it when he does the laundry. I, I do the laundry in our house and I actually like it, but if, the, if I come home one day and he's done the laundry, I make sure and thank him for it. And he may do it again if I keep thanking him for it. And he also likes it when I make a new meal. And so I'm not too, a few weeks ago I made this new meal I found on the internet, Mongolian beef, we love Payway. And so I did this copycat recipe and all of it, all of my children loved it. Carl loved it, it turned awesome. out great. And so I was like kind of getting, getting a little full of myself. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna try this again. Tried out chicken pad thai, did not go well. It was pretty much like eating it peanut was, butter. It was disgusting. It was nasty. <laughs> it, it was pretty much like eating peanut butter noodles and chicken. That was, that was basically how, how it tasted. Have you ever seen somebody eat out of spite? Yes, that was me. Have you me. seen this? I so was like the only everybody, one that ate. everybody is like, I want to tell the story. <laughs> everybody was like, um, our, one of our kids said, this is gross. And just kind of like said what everybody in the room was feeling, including Lindsay. And so I started cutting vegetables because the rest of us were being like vegetables and hummus. But Lindsay had spent the time and spent the money, so she's eating like this. I was like, I'm not gonna let this go to waste. <laughs> but it was not good. But it didn't. It didn't end up end up in a fight between us because I knew, you know, he he likes it when I cook a new meal, yeah. and if it if it turns out bad once in a while, it's okay. And we encourage each other in that. And I like to call myself the CEO in our family, and that means chief encouragement officer. So I have to be the one that encourages him the most and encourages our kids the most. And even when you're not feeling it, even if you don't have a good day, sometimes I have bad days, I still want to express contentment. I still want to tell him I love my life. And you know, you may not feel like you love your life right now. Maybe you're really frustrated with your situation. But I bet if you sit down, you could come up with one or two things that you do love about your life. In Philippians 4.8, it says, Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Yeah, and I'd flip this too and say um, to the women, women, your encouragement means more to your husbands than you know. I don't know you. I don't know your temperament. I don't know your marriage. I just know I'm right on this. Your encouragement, women, means more to your husbands than you know. Lindsay is my chief encouragement officer. She sits up front every service, uh, not every service, but every service she comes to um, and takes notes every service. She'll come to multiple services every single weekend and take notes again the second or third time she's heard the same sermon. She'll travel between services. She'll clap if, during the sermon at points. She'll talk back to me. That's good. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Y'all can join her in that a little bit if you want, mm -hmm. some of you. And uh, mm -hmm. she, uh, she's really good at that. When I get home, it's really encouraging to me um, at church, if I have, you know, people come up to me in the lobby, and, and as they often do, you often do, and say, hey, this specific thing has really helped me today, so thanks for that, and that really builds me up, but when I go home, if Lindsay doesn't say that, it feels empty. Like, if she doesn't say, hey, the sermon was good, here's the specific reason why I loved it, I will feel like the weekend was a failure. I mean, we could have baptized 10 people, but if she doesn't do that, I feel like I missed something. And so she does that. She'll, she even says this thing, like she'll compliment me. She doesn't say this every week, but, you know, every so often she'll tell what she liked in the sermon. She'll be like, babe, how'd you come up with that? And I'll say, huh, that's just what I do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but I know some of you are thinking, well, yeah, I, want, I wish my wife did that. And here's the thing. Lindsay didn't do that. I communicated to her, here's how I need you to encourage me, like this very specific way on Sunday afternoons, this way in the services, front row, that really makes me feel good. I can have a room full of people who are looking at me like they're half asleep, but if I see you taking notes, I can keep going. And so over time, even though she's like, that doesn't make sense, how could my encouragement mean more than like 100 other people, she finally just chose to believe it and said, okay, if that's what you say, then that's what I'll do. And women, that's true for your man. It, he, you, you need to ask him, how can I encourage you? When can I encourage you? Because your encouragement means more to him than anyone else's. Um, one thing that's important for us, kind of in this section of truth, is how we fight. Uh, because we fight, and, and we try to fight fairly. So why don't you tell them the, yeah. the rule. We have a rule that we do not say fine to each other. So it's not, how are you, I'm fine, it's fine. So if we're in an argument, we don't say fine and leave the room. We try to discuss it and communicate about it. Because what, what you're saying when you say fine in an argument is you're either saying this, this isn't worth communicating about, or you're saying 
I'm a pushover, my opinion doesn't matter, you can do whatever you want. And that's not true in our, in our marriage. We don't want that to be true, so we don't say fine to each other. Yeah, and I get, like, there may be a time where you need to get your cool, right? But um, if, if you say fine in words or actions, what you're just saying is you're not worth it. Like, I'd rather my spouse use really bad, harsh language with me than say fine, because at least that's saying, hey, I'm trying to communicate here. Not well, but I'm at least trying, right? Um, we, uh, we've actually fought about fine, because there's been sometimes, like, in, in a fight, where like one of us is trying to show grace to the other person to so be like, okay, that's fine. And then we'll be like, why are you saying fine? You don't care. It's like, I'm not saying fine. I'm just saying fine. Like I want to show you grace. It's all fine. Can we just let it be fine? And then we just kind of move on and <laughs> rule kind of backfire sometimes. Um, we also uh, really think it's important to let our kids see us fight because we've each talked to people who never saw their parents fight like they growing up and their parents wouldn't do that. So they go behind closed doors and, and all that stuff. And, and I get there's some things that like kids shouldn't hear, you know, in discussions in private. But I think it's healthy that our kids see us fight. Um, we don't hide that because I don't want my kids to grow up. And then the first thing that goes wrong where they have a fight in their marriage to think, oh, well, our parents never fought. So our marriage is destined to failure because this isn't how it's supposed to be. So we think that's real important. Um, we're not always the best at this. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, one time in the kitchen several months ago, it must have been around mealtime because like everybody was in the kitchen, and we were getting in a debate that turned into an argument that turned into, you're a worse person, I can yell louder, you know, it's just like getting out of hand real quick. And one of my kids, I, I see like on my periphery, and I look over at him, he is sitting at the kitchen table, he climbs under the kitchen table and starts crying because he's scared that mom and dad are yelling at each other. Well, this just sent me over the edge. Don't awe at that. I did not awe. That sent me over the edge. So I just looked at him and said, bud, this is normal. This is what married people do. I love your mom. We're going to work this out. We're having a civil conversation right now. This is what marriage is like. He's Um, never going to get married. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He took a vow of singleness after that. But we we think it's important to let, uh, let our kids see us argue. We try to communicate about our communication. A few years ago, Lindsay read this article. And it had these stats you've probably heard, like women use, you know, 40,000 words a day and men use 10,000 words a day or something like that that's insanely different. And so sometimes when I get home from work, if it's been a series of meetings, she's been like home with the kids, stay-at-home mom. So she's loving, wanting, needing some adult interaction. She's like peppering me with questions. What was this meeting about? How'd that go? What, what'd you have for lunch? Well, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like giving one-word answers, good, bad, no, yes. And so she'll just say to me, have you used all your words today? <laughs> and I'll say, Yes. I have used them, <laughs> and, uh, but we communicate about communicating, and I think that's helpful to get us on the same page, um, and we share our struggles, and I think this is really the, the goal of living in truth, uh, of, of being truthful with each other, because it starts with encouragement, um, but what you want to get to is a place where you can openly share struggles. So it was a couple years ago few years ago or so, I don't remember when exactly, but things in our family were good, uh, things in church were good, we were good, but I was just having, I was just down, and um, I, I wasn't like clinically depressed, but uh, just really down about everything, like nothing was just bringing me joy. One day I got home, I was sitting in the kitchen, it was a good day, like kids were good, she's cooking dinner, excited to see me, and, and she's talking to me, and, and I was just kind of said, I don't care. And we were just talking about a few different things. I was like, no, like, I just literally don't care, like, about anything. And she had kind of seen this been building for a few weeks or whatever, and she looked at me, and she wasn't quite crying, but she said, honey, you need to get help. And I received that. So I called, contacted a counselor, and I started the one-on-one counseling that I've talked about in here before. But if we didn't have a marriage that was based on truth, and being open and honest with each other, I don't know if she would have felt comfortable saying that. I don't know if I would have felt comfortable receiving that. But because it is an encouraging atmosphere, we are able to share those things, and I was able to get to a healthier place afterwards. Yeah, and you need to share, wives need to share their struggles with their husbands too. Today may be a difficult day for a lot of you because it's Mother's Day. It's maybe the first time you've celebrated Mother's Day without your mom, maybe you lost her this year. Or maybe you got another negative pregnancy test. Or maybe you lost a baby this year. And those are really painful things, and you need to share those with each other. Yeah. Um, We had a couple, uh, we've spoken about this, but 
um, we've had we've had, we had a couple miscarriages several years ago, and um, it wasn't until and like we grieved that intensely at the time. I didn't realize until Lindsay shared this with me uh, that she still carries that pain with her forever, um, in, in, intensely. Like I knew the pain was there, but I didn't realize how intense it was for her until she had communicated that to me. And so now I can share that struggle with her because she communicated that. First Corinthians 7.23, we're going to move on to the third thing I want you to write down, but here's the scripture. It says, God paid a high price for you. And that's the gospel. God so loved the world, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die in your place so that whoever believes in him will have real life forever. That's the gospel. That's grace. And so our third point we want you to write down is live in grace. And I phrase that carefully because it's not like dabble in grace or, or kind of sprinkle some grace on top or, uh, you know, if you need some grace, show some grace. It's live in grace daily, moment by moment, exist in grace. Yeah, Brene Brown says in her new book, Rising Strong, that she tells a newly engaged couples, I am certain you will hurt each other, and so you need grace. And it's, it's sometimes just in the daily things, um, looking yeah. over daily faults and struggles. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, Carl's very OCD. I have diagnosed him with this. He's never been diagnosed, but I've diagnosed him. And um, he just... Normal things that people do sometimes annoy him. So if I'm chewing loudly, and I'm not talking about chewing with my mouth open. I'm talking about like crunching an apple loudly in my mouth. He's kind of annoyed by that. Or if I have mail out on the counter, it needs to be put away. And, you know, one day I was bringing a water into our bedroom, and he was in bed reading a book. And apparently I gulped it too loudly because I took a drink, and I looked over at him, and he was giving me this look like, do you know that's the most annoying noise a person could make and so I said to him do you think giving me that look will make me drink quieter and and, and I didn't answer I thought this was didn't. a trick question <laughs> but we have to show each other grace in those moments he has to give me grace I have to give him grace and sometimes it's something bigger sometimes it's not just a, a daily annoyance Some, sometimes it may be something bigger like your spouse doesn't believe or doesn't come to church with you and the Bible talks about that in first Peter 3 verses 1 and 2 say Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Holly Furtick says, let God be God, you be Jesus. And what she means by that is, if your husband has a character trait or a sin issue in his life, or if he's not a believer, God will take care of that. You be Jesus. You serve him. You show him grace. You pray for him. When you get married, you are committing to show grace no matter what. I heard of one pastor, he talked about when he meets with a man and woman that he's going to perform the wedding ceremony of, he says, hey, I want you to imagine you're married. Now imagine you just found out your spouse had an affair on you. Now imagine forgiving them. He says, if you can't imagine forgiving them, I don't want you to get married. Now that's pretty blunt. But I tell couples in their wedding ceremony when I perform that, hey, you're making a predecision today to show this person grace for the rest of your life, no matter what they do. And we have each done things. I mean, it's, you know, it's fine to say, like, grace in the small things, Carl's OCD, whatever. Mm -hmm. I was joking with our production volunteers. I was like, you all know that, don't you? They're like, yes, we know that. Um, <laughs> we've done small things, but the thing is, we've each done things that we've confessed to each other that deeply hurt the other person, that brought the other person to tears, that gave the other person that feeling, oh, I'm, I've just been kicked in the gut and I can't breathe. And without grace, I don't know how you do marriage. I mean, without truth and grace, I don't know how you do marriage. If you figured it out, hey, I'm happy for you. I just know we can't have, we cannot have a great marriage without truth and grace. We could have an okay marriage, but we could not have a great marriage without truth and grace. In my opinion, as a pastor, a healthy sex life cannot happen without grace. I've met with numerous couples over the past seven years in this church who have uh, just about every sexual problem I can imagine, and a whole bunch I couldn't even imagine. And some of it is a thought life that's just out of control. And some of it is somebody did something before marriage, 
that is creeping up in bitterness or resentment or shame or regret in marriage and affecting the bedroom now. And some of it is a physical problem, like something's physically wrong here. This isn't working. What do we do? Because it makes us feel ashamed. And some of it is pornography. And there's this and list too big to even go into of problems that happen within marriage. But without sex, those things will destroy it. Without and grace. without grace. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you can't hold on to past mistakes. I've had women come to me before and they've said, well, I'm not going to have sex with my husband because he's looking at pornography. And you, you have to work through that, but you can't withhold sex. And with, because you're, when you withhold sex, you're withholding grace mm -hmm. is what you're doing. Yeah, and you know, I'll even add something to we haven't said in the other services, that um, so many men withhold sex from their wives because they've gone down this path of pornography um, that men, if you're withholding sex because she can't live up to this fake standard that doesn't exist in real life but in which you've immersed yourself for the past decade, uh, you need to get help because you're destroying your sex life. And that's where you need to immerse yourself in truth of what's real and who God says you are and who your wife really is. Uh, I canceled a couple one time. I was going to do their wedding and uh, it was like we were meeting before the wedding to talk about, hey, here's the wedding, but also just talk about some marriage stuff. And I don't do counseling, but I, they'd done like a premarital counseling thing. So we talked about that. And one thing we talked about was sex. And um, it became evident in the conversation really quick that the bride uh, was feeling a lot of shame about what she had done before she had ever met this guy that she was getting ready to marry. And it was really holding her captive, even, even though she had given her life to Christ and he was a Christian um, she was held captive by the shame of her past, and she was uh, getting emotional sitting in our living room, and I said, let me push on you a little bit. I said, you've given your life to Christ. You've, you've done that. So when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see the things you've done. What he sees is pure, is holiness, is beautiful. So that's the same way your husband sees you because he's a Christian and he's accepted the grace of Jesus and he loves that you've accepted the grace of Jesus. So he sees you as pure and holy and beautiful. So when you walk down the aisle in that white dress, Jesus isn't going to be thinking, I don't know why she's wearing a white dress. He's going to say that's exactly who she is. And when your husband sees that, he's not going to be thinking, well, I don't know why she's wearing a white dress. What he's going to be thinking is, that's exactly who she is. She has the purity of Jesus. She has the holiness of Jesus. She's perfect in his sight because of him. And that's who I get to marry today. So the only person holding on to that past is you. Mm -hmm. And you need to accept what both your husband and your, and your God say about you. And it was cool because not long after that, uh, she approached me and she was grinning from ear to ear. She said, hey, I wanted to let you know, um, I hadn't shopped for a dress until you said that. And I knew that here, but I didn't know it here. And I needed to be reminded of that. And she said, I bought a dress last week. Amen. And what I want you to know is we have grace. We have grace. So if you've repented and been baptized, if you've made Jesus your Lord and your Savior, saying you're going to be my leader and forgiver forever, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see the things you've done or haven't done. He sees Jesus. He sees perfection. He sees purity. He sees holiness because that's what he makes you when you give your life to him. And the invitation's open for anybody who wants to accept it to say, that's what I want. That's what I want to be. That's who I want to be. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm yours. And he'll say, come on in. I'll make you new. So we're going to celebrate communion when we're finished. A tray's going to be passed down your row with stacks of cups on it. Cracker in one, juice in the other. We want you to take that stack of cups and as our band plays, we put a verse about grace on the screen. I want you to eat and drink that to remind yourself how Jesus loves you. So let me kind of connect grace and marriage and truth and all this stuff. I like what Matt Chandler says. Matt Chandler is a pastor in Texas, and he kind of has a soapbox where he bashes the idea of the one. People look for the one. I found the one. I can't find the one. He says, the one is a lie from the pit of hell. He says, it is anti-biblical. And he says, you know how I know my wife is the one? Because I married her. According to scripture, that's what makes her the one and nothing else. And the way we'd say it is this. We aren't married because we love each other. We love each other because we're married. And that is the opposite of what our culture says. And I'd connect it to Jesus this way. 
Jesus doesn't love you because you came home to him. You came home to him because he loves you. And the invitation's open for anybody who wants it. See, we need the church. If we wanted an okay marriage, we wouldn't need the church. I mean, we, we, I think we could read some self-help books and, and we could have an okay marriage. I, think, I really think we could. But to have a great marriage, we need this. We need to be reminded God, our creator, wants us to have a great marriage because nobody else tells us that. We need to be reminded living open and honestly, living in truth is the best way to live because nobody else tells us that. And we need to be reminded there's grace. You will hurt each other, but there's grace. Every single time, no matter how far you fall, there's always, always grace. That's why we, we need the church to have a great marriage. Yeah, and sometimes people will come up to us and say, well, you just got lucky. You picked right or you picked a good one, which is true. But, um, but actually, it, t- it takes a lot of work. I mean, it takes, it takes a lot of hard work. And mm. it, it takes a lot of work to remember that God wants you to have a great marriage and to put time and money into that. And prioritize it in our budget and it takes work to be truthful with each other sometimes it's uncomfortable and and it takes work to offer grace and to, to, and to not just offer it every now and then but to live in it but it's worth it mm-hmm. it takes work but it's worth it and um, there's some of you here who don't want to get married like you're like I am, I am good being single amen Paul at the beginning right because you have had such bad marriage modeled for you I mean, it's your parents, it's maybe your peers, you're seeing their marriages fall apart, and you're saying, you know what, it sounded good a couple years ago, but now that I've seen the reality of what's happening to everybody I know, uh uh-uh, I'm out. Maybe you, but but, but here's what I want you to know, is it's worth the risk. You cannot have love without the risk of being hurt, but it's worth it. And if you'll run to Jesus and hang on to truth and grace, it will be worth the risk. So um, let me just close by saying, then Lindsay's going to pray for us. Um, there's a bunch of you here um, who, who don't believe what I just said, who don't believe it's worth it, because you have no hope in your marriage. And you feel like it's hanging by a thread, maybe, and you can't even see the thread. And you contacted the lawyer this week, like you found the name, you sent the email, and you're saying, I'm done. Like, hey, truth, grace, sounds great, but th- not for this. Don't give up. Just hang on to Jesus one more day. He will give you grace and truth to get through today. And I know it's hard when you want it to be great and you hear God wants it to be great, but it's not. You just keep hanging on. Because when Jesus was in the tomb, it looked like all hope was gone. But on Easter Sunday, he rose from the grave. And I know there's some marriages in here that are dead. But Jesus is going to resurrect them. And just as he raised Christ from the dead, he's going to bring new life to your marriage. And it may take years. It's going to take a lot of work. But it's going to be worth it. Because God wants you to have a great marriage if you base it on grace and truth. Yeah, Yeah, let's pray. God, I just thank you for the gift of marriage. And I just want to pray for the marriages of our church that that they would be based on you, that that you would remind them that that you want a great marriage for them and that you could remind them to be truthful with each other and to live in grace. God, thank you for giving us grace by sending your son. We just pray that we would remember that every day and not take it for granted. It's in your name I pray. Amen.